All right, let's dive into actually prepping to start painting. First things first, I'm gonna be totally transparent. I really need to kick this off with some kind of fun project. Um, that's not to say that making original work isn't fun, um, but rather when I talk about something that's just for fun, what I mean is really that I'm following what I think that I need. This is something that I talk about with the artists that I work with all of the time. If you're feeling kind of burnt out or run down, the solution isn't always just to keep figuring out how to be productive and how to stay on task. I think this can be especially important to keep in mind when you're actively working on improving certain skills um, or refining certain techniques. Getting those skills or techniques up to the point that you want them can take a lot of repetition and this can start to become really tedious and take you down the path to burnout, even if you have yourself set up for success as much as you possibly can. So. When that happens, I usually encourage the artists that I work with and I would encourage myself to think of a project that would just be fun to embark on. Something that just enriches you or reflects what you're personally interested in at the time. Lately, I have binge watched The Bear. I am so late to this train. The show came out a year ago. It's already had two seasons come out, but it was just incredible and it got me thinking so much about the creative process. And honestly, it reminds me a little bit of watching Inside or watching Arcane, um, just shows that really made me want to make things for one reason or another. That's what I wanna do. I wanna do a personal painting. I want to go ahead and paint one of the characters. This isn't going to be about a body of work. This is simply going to be a painting that I embark on for fun. And so I went ahead and kicked this off by taking a whole bunch of screenshots <laughs> um, from the first season of the show. And I want to walk you through today how I actually prep those to paint them. You know, how I whittle down really similar references into the one that I actually want to choose to work with and what it might look like for me to go ahead and prep that in Photoshop. If watching me go through this process is really helpful to you or you feel like you want this kind of support in your own practice, you know, helping artists to figure out what they need to be focusing on at any given time and to keep them on track toward the larger goal of really painting the way that you want to paint and achieving mastery over that, that's exactly what I do. So if you want to find out more about my mentorships or how they work or you can dive right in and apply to see if we are a fit to work together. I have links to find out more and to submit an application down in the description. All right, let's go ahead and jump in to these reference images and pick out the best one and prep it to paint. So first things first, I want to talk about what I considered when I actually was choosing these images and taking these screenshots. So this is going to really echo what I talked about in my last video, but this is a slightly different scenario and I think it'll really hammer home a lot of the way that I think about choosing reference so you can start to think like a professional artist when you're choosing reference too. So the first thing that I wanted to think about was what actually looks like a reference for the kinds of paintings that I want to paint. And if you have watched The Bear at all, you know that most of the shots are in this dingy kitchen interior. The light is not particularly inspiring, or at least it doesn't really mimic the kind of lighting that I see in the paintings I'm really drawn to. So to recap some of what that actually looks like, I've gone ahead and pulled back up my vision board or inspiration board for the kinds of pieces I'm really drawn to creating. There's a good amount of variety here, but one thing that struck me over and over is that I really need to have a single light source and I need to maximize the opportunity for there to be color that is brought out by that light. And typically in those dingy interior shots, we're just not gonna get that kind of lighting quality. So right off the bat, I knew that if I wanted to paint, you know, a moment from this show, I really needed to pick a scene that was outdoors. Thankfully, there are a couple of scenes that take place in the bear that are out back behind the restaurant itself. And so I combed through a couple of episodes and started, you know, taking screen captures of moments that I thought would give me the kind of shadow and light 
that I'm looking for. So the first thing right off the bat is a series of screenshots from one particular scene. And there's really two scenes that I'm gonna be diving into here. And you'll see I'm pretty indiscriminate in taking these. The difference between these moments are so subtle. You know, a slight shift of the gaze, a slight lift of the eyebrow, a very minute difference in the tilt of the head. And what I'm looking for here is really what image, what still that I find really matches what I expect to see from my vision board. You know, what is the kind of pose? What's the kind of angle? What's the kind of light? What's the kind of color? So right off the bat, I think this first image, it works pretty well. The angle of the head is pretty severe though. Um, if somebody were actually in the studio, they probably wouldn't hold this pose for very long because it puts your neck in a really strained position. And that's not to say that it's not necessarily an image worth painting, but most of the images that I see on my vision board look like poses that somebody could have held in a studio. So that's a kind of easy shortcut for me to figure out if something is likely going to be a fit. So already here I'm getting into some poses where he's maybe a little bit more upright. Um, this one is a little bit more expressive than the others. We have a little bit more emotion coming through with the lift of the eyebrows. That being said, you know, anything that's going to make the subject basically like create wrinkles on their face, um, isn't going to be a pose they can hold for very long. So this might not be something that looks very natural to paint, even though it looks obviously very natural in a photographic still. This image does definitely look like one that a model could hold for a good amount of time. That being said, I've really lost clarity in the light and shadow pattern, which doesn't match with what I see in my vision board. Now here we get back to something that I think is a little bit more akin to what I can expect to see here. And I wanna compare it to the very first image. Yeah, already we have a pose that is probably a little bit more natural to hold. Now we have one that's even more natural than that. One thing that I wanted to do here is that I wasn't against really capturing moments where, you know, the, the actor is in the middle of conversation. I probably don't want a moment where their mouth is open based on, again, what I see on this board. But, you know, something where it looks like they could start speaking or they might have just finished speaking, it tends to lend a lot of personality to the image. And that's why I have some of these that really are mid conversation or, you know, mid thought as we see here. This is a really expressive pose. I really like the light on it. That being said, it's definitely a split second where, you know, the subject is going to be in this pose. It looks a little bit more like a candid shot than maybe a posed painting. This has a little bit more of a classical feel. Same thing here, just a slightly different angle. I really like the fact that we have a clear light and shadow pattern as evidenced by the shadowing on the eye sockets and the cast shadow below the nose. As we get from the cheekbone into the jaw and neck, um, the shadows start to run together or become a little bit more subtle. That being said, overall, I think this one is a strong candidate. So now we get into some of the stills from the other scene that I considered. This is also an outdoor scene. And I actually saw this because of um, a YouTube thumbnail from FX. And I saw it and something about the way that they bumped up the brightness of the image really made me think of more of a classical painting. And I thought to myself, this looks like a painting. and. If you recall from last week's video, one thing that I was really quick to emphasize is that anytime a reference looks like a recognizable painting, maybe not one painting in particular, but it just has that painting feel to it, that's usually an indication that it's gonna be a really solid reference to paint from. So I went ahead and found the scene that this was from and started diving in to getting some stills. And I just wanna compare a couple of these. So these two stills are really similar. I would say the big difference is that I feel like I get a little bit more expression because the eyebrows are a little bit more lifted here. So, so far, I think this one is standing out to me the most. This one, we get a little bit more of that feeling of going into speech. Um, I'd say it's, it's really close between these two. Yeah, right now, I think these are my top two choices. There is one downside to this image, which is that we are getting it at a pretty extreme angle. 
um, I probably wouldn't see the top of the model shoulders in any of the paintings that are inspiring me right now. So this might be something where I really loosely evoke the shoulders and potentially move them down a little bit. Um, or I might just accept that this is a little bit of an atypical pose and just run with it and paint it as is. Between the two of these, I think I'm gonna go ahead and choose the one where the jaw is in a more neutral position. I think honestly, I could work with either one of these and have this really give me what I want. And I might change my mind. So let's just go ahead and open up both of these. Right now, I'm just spending a little bit of time taking these in and letting my eye just flick back and forth between the two versions, trying to figure out if one of them appears to make a stronger composition versus another. Truth be told, I really like the one where he looks like he is about to speak or has just finished speaking. Um, I like that I can see a little bit more of the mouth and the jaw and the expression that's really captured there. It creates a little bit more of a sense of a smile, but one that's subtle, one that doesn't look like it's difficult to hold or it's going to be forced or contrived. So I might go ahead and mock both of these up because the mock-up process is going to be very similar between the two of them and it's not really going to add extra work for me. But before I go any further, I want to go ahead and compare these to the lighting that's used for this particular YouTube thumbnail. And I want to go ahead and bump both of these up until they really have more of this feeling. So I'm going to simply start to play around with the image adjustments. And already this isn't really giving me the look that I want. So let's go ahead and change gears and let's try the camera raw filter for this. Now this isn't a raw file, so I'm not going to get a ton of bang for my buck here. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to bump up the exposure of the entire image. So I wanted the shadows to be lighter. I wanted the lights to be lighter. I wanted the midtones to be lighter. Um, but then I didn't want the lights to be totally blown out and overexposed. So I went ahead and lowered those a little bit. Now, one difference between these two images is that typically when I'm editing in Photoshop, and this might actually get a little bit lost when I export this video and upload it to YouTube, but typically when you're in Photoshop, you can see reds a lot more vividly um, than what winds up getting exported out of Photoshop and uploaded onto the web. So I would say this image on the left, this thumbnail might have actually started pretty similarly to this image. And then it lost a lot of the warmth when it was exported and uploaded. Um, and it has a little bit more of like a blue feeling to me. I can artificially lower some of the saturation to get this image to this point, but I know a lot of this is going to get lost for the sake of YouTube. So I'm probably gonna leave it more or less as is. And now if I toggle between these two versions, suddenly I have a lot more information in the shadows. And to me, it feels like I can see a great deal more color. One thing I can do to bring a little bit of color back into this piece is to actually bump up something like vibrance. But again, I actually like a lot of the color that I'm seeing. I don't want to make this suddenly look really artificial by boosting that. But in general, this is something that I like playing with for a lot of the reference images that I edit. I think this is a good starting point. So I'm just going to go ahead and apply this. I'm also going to actually, I'm not going to crop into this yet. I'm going to quickly just apply the same filter to the second version here. And I want to consider these both just again at this stage, because I can see a little bit more now that there's a little bit more light. Oh, I'm still, I'm actually leaning toward the top one, even though again, I think the bottom one is maybe a little bit more of a true like neutral pose. Um, but, rather than rush into a decision, I want to talk about the next thing that I really noticed from these. And that is that these paintings really remind me of some of Nick Alm's work. Um, so this is one of the Nick Alm paintings from my inspiration board. If you scroll down, you can see um, some of these are additional Nick Alm paintings, but there's something about this image in particular that really 
is evoked for me when I look at these reference images. So I want to go ahead and run with that. I want to try and visualize what this piece would look like if I painted it using a similar approach that Nagalm took here. So a background that has this kind of warm, neutral um, color that's pretty light in value and maybe a value or color mixture for the hair that winds up being very flat and perhaps envelops the face. This is going to be a little bit different since our subject is male and has shorter hair. Here, having this value really extend down suggests longer hair. So I might not be able to play with some of the mark making that Nick Alm did in this piece in the same way, but I think this can give me a really good guide as to how I might move forward and paint this piece. So the next thing I want to go ahead and do is I want to go ahead and crop this. And I want to treat this as if I want my reference to be as close of a one-to-one -to, -one to my painting as I can possibly make it. And that means that I want to go ahead and crop it to an aspect ratio for a panel that I actually have. One thing I could go ahead and do is set it to square. Again, that's going to have a kind of similar feeling to the Nick Alm piece here. And even just from visualizing it this way, this feels a little bit claustrophobic. Obviously we are looking down at the subject here, but there's something about this that just, I think exaggerates the like slouched position. Um, it just doesn't really create the, the energy that I'm looking for, I think is the best way that I can articulate it. So let's go ahead. And let's put this into a pretty standard like eight by 10 aspect ratio and let's keep it vertical for now. I think there's something about the vertical framing that maybe f makes the model feel like he's a little bit more upright, even though obviously we've changed nothing about the pose. So this is a possibility. I like the kind of diagonal feeling of we get the sense of like where the gaze of the subject is headed and we have room on the page to reflect that. But just for sake of argument, let's see what happens when we turn the aspect ratio the other way around. I would say this really does have a much more horizontal feeling. Um, now, you know, to mimic what we would get when we actually have something like a YouTube thumbnail, let's go ahead and set it to 16 by nine. Now, I feel like we actually have a good bit more space here because there's breathing room around the shoulders. Um, strangely, this really doesn't make me want to change it the way the eight by 10 aspect ratio did. And honestly, I'm not really going by like compositional rules here. I'm going by what makes intuitive sense and what matches what I typically see on my inspiration board. I know on YouTube, it's so easy to make a YouTube video where it's like, just follow this one composition rule or make sure that you follow these five composition rules to create really strong images. And while I think that exploring those idea of compositional rules can be a helpful thought exercise, um, at the end of the day, what really matters is whether you're creating the kind of compositions that you're personally drawn to. And this varies so much from person to person, given what your personal taste is, that there might be compositions that I personally really enjoy that other people would never ever consider. Things like, you know, having the model completely square to the viewer with breathing room all the way around or a composition where you have something like a floating head on the canvas or something where part of the model extends off of the edge of the canvas and your eye is literally led off of the page. Um, these are all rules that I've heard other painters discussed before. And for some people, they might be really helpful. For other people, they might directly prevent you from making the kinds of pieces you're interested in. So that's why I'm really going about this somewhat intuitively, but using my vision board as a guide as much as I can. First things first, if I did stick with something like a 16 by nine aspect ratio, which I don't even actually have a canvas for. I probably would go ahead and make sure I had breathing room all the way around the model's face and head, um, which gets us a lot closer actually to this thumbnail. And that's not really by design. The thumbnail also has 
the model pretty far off to one side. And I'd say the crop is about there. And really this is giving the person who's creating the thumbnail room to put text without it going over somebody's face. <laughs> um, this isn't how I would actually compose a painting. I think if I were composing a painting, I would probably come in a little bit closer to the face so that it can take up more space. I would have breathing room probably around both shoulders and the top of the head, and we would come up with something that is probably a little bit more centered as a result, although I do like this sort of asymmetrical flow to this image. But to actually turn this into something that is closer to a panel I actually have, I would have to change this into like a one to two aspect ratio, which as you can tell is pretty extreme. Now, right now, I don't think I have any 12 by 16 panels, so I'm not going to explore that option. 11 by 14, you can see, is much more square. And especially when we're in this horizontal layout, I feel like we're getting back to the issue of the square layout from before. So let's see what happens when I go ahead and I make this an 11 by 14, but vertical. I really like this idea of the face being a little bit higher up. Now going back to eight by 10 as a size for this potential painting, especially given that I would be painting some of the torso or leaving room that accommodates the torso, it would make the head very small. So I think going back up to something like 11 by 14, makes a lot of sense in this particular case. Um, 12 by 16 actually might be better, but since I don't have a 12 by 16 panel right now, I'm not going to do this. But typically my rule of thumb is for me, the way that I like to paint, I need the face to be about fist size. And now I'm at the point where I can intuit how big I need to make the painting in order to make that happen. So 11 by 14, I think is a good minimum for something where I have this kind of composition. So let's go ahead and run with this. And I just want to remove some of the kind of dead information on here. So I'm just gonna go and I'm gonna do a content aware fill. And already I can see that I didn't quite mask off enough here. So let's go ahead and try that again. All right, this is much better. Obviously this is not perfect. The anatomy that's happening with the arms is atrocious, but that's okay because we are not gonna include all of this information down here. Um, what I'm likely going to do is actually have a bit of this color that I think really matches what we see in this Nick Alm piece extended below. And I'm just going to evoke some of the torso without fully painting it the way I see in something like this Carolyn Anderson piece. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I need to go ahead and visualize what that looks like. So I understand what I want this to actually look like in the painting itself. And one of the easiest ways to do this is to actually take a look at some previous paintings of mine and sample those paintings in order to get the textures that I want. So I've gone ahead and pulled up a few images just off of my website where I have done exactly what I need to have happen here. Um, I have a very simple abstracted wash of paint over the background and I am arbitrarily stopping the subject from going all the way down the image. Um, I particularly like what I did here, but it this is in profile. Um, so it's not solving the same problem and I might not be able to create, you know, just a single nice brush mark that really indicates where the figure is and where I'm stopping painting the figure. Um, this one was a little bit more subtle where I sort of faded the figure out. And here, I think there's like some really interesting things happening. That being said, I don't have like a tone on the canvas here, which makes creating some of this erased effect a little bit more difficult. I can't wipe out um, if my wash layer 
isn't fully dry. So I wanted to go ahead and take a look at how Nagalm solved some of these problems because he was the painter that really came to mind when I took a look at this reference. So here we have a neckline that follows essentially where the collar would be of the shirt. Here we have something that's a little similar to what I've done where we have some brush marks here. Um, they don't necessarily follow um, the clothing at all, but they do follow certain pieces of the anatomy. We have an indication of the shoulder, the front of the neck, the back of the neck, um, SCM muscle here. Really cool design where we really get the bottom of the jaw, we get the side of the neck, and this is, you know, somewhat arbitrarily shaped in order to create some visual interest. I don't think I have room to do this here, but it is really helpful for me to see how a painter, a master like Nick Alm would solve the problem of somebody with short hair, where you just have that floating head on a very simple background. Reason being, when you have a model with longer hair, it's easy to just like let that long hair take your eye down to the bottom of the page so you don't just have a floating head. Being able to visualize how a really masterful artist solves this problem is super helpful to my process. And this was one painting that I really wanted to pull up. Um, we don't necessarily have the same extreme angle, but there are some real similarities in terms of the tilt of the head, um, the fact that we can see the collar of the shirt. Um, I thought this might be an interesting one to look at. And actually, I really like how we can see some raw canvas here um, that's just very lightly toned. So I might actually use a little bit of that to mock this up. So already, I really like just how much I can see a very similar value between these two. And again, I'm really just using this to visualize more of this background color and value and potentially this edge of the neck and where that meets the, the canvas texture. So to better facilitate that, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna just move this up and then I'm going to start erasing out the parts of this that are actually a painting. Okay, so already I can start to see like what this would look like if I just go the approach of having a floating head here. And this, frankly, looks a little odd, um, which is not super surprising. Um, I just want to take away some of the shoulder here and see what that looks like. And then maybe extend a little bit of this canvas. So when I have it in this view and I've removed a lot of the figure, suddenly the crop just doesn't feel right anymore. And it really does feel like we need some indication of the torso itself. So one thing that I can do is I can paste this back in again and I can do a second pass. And again, I am just trying right here to get some of that canvas texture, especially since this is toned really exactly the way that I need it to be. I'm just gonna use some of the clone stamp tool to figure out what this looks like if I fade some of this information away. Now we have something more than a floating head, but we can see really what this is going to look like if it's taking up more of the canvas. And suddenly this like very vertical aspect ratio just doesn't seem to work the way that I want for it to. And I have a couple of options here. I can either suggest a little bit more of the body. So to visualize that, I can erase a little bit more of this canvas overlay. or I can crop it in further. 
And really, every time I'm making a change, I'm trying to ask myself, does this really serve the image? And one thing that happened just now is that as I really reestablished this shoulder, I was like, I really thought this read a little bit better when I didn't have that there. So one thing I can do is I really can just continue to play with this. until I arrive at the overall shapes that I want. I don't necessarily have to stay true to the original layout. Now, one thing I am doing is I'm really trying to rapidly switch between this image that I have enlarged and the thumbnail. And the thumbnail, even though I have more of an indication of the rest of his body, it looks so awkwardly like a floating head to me right now. And the real reason is that the value has been compressed in so many places, but not his face. And so I'm just selectively reintroducing a little bit of that contrast and that value range every time checking to make sure that it really makes sense and that it's serving the image overall. One thing I think the image might benefit from is having some other dark values somewhere else. Um, and this can look like a lot of things. In the Nick Alm piece, we have a cast shadow that's on the the neck and the collarbone area um, that is just as dark as the shadowing on the face or some of the shadowing in the hair or the hat. And in this image, we really don't have that. We do have some darkness from the apron, but it's it's not quite as strong and it's not balancing the image in quite the same way. And when I give my eye a break from this, and I ask myself, you know, is this really working? Um, and I just quickly like snap my head back, especially to this thumbnail view. It just still feels like the head is floating in space at such an awkward angle. And this is something where you can have a reference that works so well in so many ways, but it just creates a problem that isn't always one that you can fully solve. And this is one of the most tricky things that I teach the artists that I work with is really learning how to accept when a reference just isn't working or to put in the extra work to overcome that difficulty rather than just diving into the painting and expect that it's going to be solved for you. So I'm going to try and reestablish some of this value. through the apron itself, I wanna be really mindful of the shape that I create here. I like how I have a little bit more of a V and I wanna make sure I'm not losing that at any point. It might also be nice to have some indication of the arm, but I, I don't particularly want to paint the tattoos. I think that they will be a little bit distracting. So I wanna be mindful not. Now I'm kind of trying to experiment to see what will happen if I actually create more of a diagonal versus like a triangle shape. And I think the last thing that I want to do is I want to shift all of this up just a little bit. And do one last content aware fill. And now when I look at this, I feel like there's a little bit more balance with the values of the face. I feel like this is arranged interestingly on the canvas. I have an interesting idea of what this will look like when it is on um, just a raw, like toned canvas texture. And most importantly, when I go back to my inspiration board here, I have a really clear sense of what this ought to look like. Um, and that means that I can dive into the painting trusting that if I follow the plan that I set out with here, um, that I'm gonna have a painting that I really like. So 
If you're excited to watch me paint Carmi from the bear, make sure to like and subscribe and tune back in next week.